going to dive right into it. And here we go. Luke chapter 4. Very familiar passage of scripture. I, I need to drink this hot tea. I, I apologize for that. As you know, I already suffer with a, a cough, a chronic cough. So if, I, if my voice starts giving out, we're, we're in trouble because Pastor Greg's not in here to take over. Ooh, that is hot. I think they said it was hot. I haven't heard since then. Luke chapter 4, verse, verse 1. <coughs> this is what the Bible says. It says, Jesus, full of the Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. That's interesting. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Most of us, we think that our hard times come because of the devil. You know, which is rightfully so, right? He's our adversary. Like, but here in this particular case, thank you. In this particular case, Jesus is being led to the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Now, when you, whenever you read the Bible and you, you find the word wilderness, it's, it's, it's not a fun place. Let's just say that. It's, it, you know, it's not play more. You know, it, it, it's not this, this area where you're going to go and, and you're going to enjoy your stay. Um, verse 2 says, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. <coughs> just, just think about that. 40 days. I don't know if that was every day of the 40 days, if it was sporadically throughout the 40 days, if it was just at the beginning of the 40 or at the end of the 40. But we do know that. That he was tempted by the devil and he ate nothing. So he was on a fast during those days. And at the very end of it, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to you, anyone I want to if you worship me. It'll all be yours. And Jesus said, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and said to him, stand at, on the highest point of the temple. He says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. And they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. My goodness, this scripture is so rich. Verse 13, then the devil had finished all his tempting. He left him until an opportune time. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit. And news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in, the, in their synagogues and everyone praised him. <coughs> Excuse me. drinking it like it's not hot. I don't know why, but it is steaming hot. And verse 16, I'm going to set this down. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. See, even Jesus went to church. It's his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoner and recovery of sight to the blind. He sent, <coughs> excuse me, to set up, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord. I want to go back to verse 2. We read all that so that you can understand the context of where we're going to go in the next couple of weeks because we'll be preaching out of Luke chapter 4. The title of our new series is called 40. And, and it, I want to challenge us. We're, we're going we're gonna to dive into some things that might make us squirm a little bit. But at the end of the day, we're going to be okay, yes? Because we know Jesus, what? Loves us, right? And we know that iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another man, right? Yes? And we come to be sharpened, amen? To be equipped, as, as Paul would say, we equip the saints, yes? Some of you don't look so excited. Tap your neighbor and say, it's going to be, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Full of, this, full of the Holy Spirit, Jesus 
left Jordan and was led into the wilderness, where for 40 days he, t- he was tempted by the devil. 40 days, that's going to be our focus. 40 days, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time. We thank you for everything that you're doing in our hearts, in our church, those that are watching online. God, I pray as, as, we, as we venture through your word, Lord God, as we learn, as we unpack it, God, that whether we have been walking with you for 20 plus years or we just started two weeks ago, God, that there's a, there's a challenge in our heart, there's, there's an awakening in our lives that we do what you've called us to do. We, we show our love through our obedience, through our obedience. God, as, as we are going to be challenged to be obedient on a new level, I pray that you give us the courage and the bravery, give us the, the wisdom and the know-how, God. We thank you. We give you glory and honor in your holy name we pray. Amen and amen. High five and say, let's go 40. Let's go 40, right? Some of you, like, don't want to touch people yet. Um, <clears throat> now, some of you might be turning 40 this year. How many of you are turning 40 this year? Yes, you and me, James, we're turning 40 this year. Um, <clears throat> anyone close to, I forget that we, this is a younger group. Y'all are in your 30s still. Y'all not, y'all not near 40 yet, right? Um, but this morning, I, I want to start prepping us for Easter. I, I know you might think this is kind of soon, but it really isn't because, I don't know if you realize it, but Easter is around the corner. In fact, starting on February 17th, which is a Wednesday, starting on February 17th, we'll be 46 days out from Easter. Did you know that? 46 days. And, and those of you that are going to be honest about your age, as you know, you hit, a certain, you hit a certain age, like when you blink, time's gone, right? You blink, and it's like another year. So 40 days is really nothing to most of us in here. 40 days is like you're already there, right? Easter's already here. And, and we know that Easter, <coughs> it's a celebration. It's a celebration for the Christian community because our Savior has resurrected. That's why we celebrate Easter, because Jesus was resurrected. Easter is a Christian celebration because Jesus gave us the path of reconciliation back to God. That's why we celebrate Easter. And a better way to, to, to put it is we celebrate Easter because without Jesus, you and I would have never been transformed. Without the work of the cross, without what, what he has done for us, you and I would still be the same miserable miserable people living in our pride and living in our lust and our greed but because of Jesus there's there's resurrection power come on church and it's coming up like we should be celebrating this all the time right but it's Easter and we're going to celebrate it what better way for Christians to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior this year than to fill this house with people who need to be reconciled back to God. I can't think of a better way to celebrate Easter than to fill his house with people who need to be reconciled back to God. Have you thought about that? It's in fact, Jesus told a parable, right, of the great king that threw a big banquet and all the the fancy and rich people wouldn't come to the banquet and he was so hurt and so angry, he sent his servants out. He said, go find me people, right? That's, that's, That's the parable of the church. Like, listen, listen, go find Jesus' people. In other words, evangelize. Be a soul winner. When's the last time you led someone to Jesus? When's the last time you and I maybe sat and just prayed someone through a salvation experience? Helping them understand what it means to be saved. Think about that. Because we cannot celebrate Easter any better than to fill the seats with people. I, I'm not hearing an amen. I, I'm not, I mean, this needs to get in our heart, church. <clears throat> Can I remind you that we have been given the message of reconciliation? I don't know if you know that. 
I don't know if it's ever crossed your mind, or maybe you've never heard it before. Maybe you've never understood. Like when you become a Christian, when you give your life to Jesus, then our purpose, our purpose as Christians is to reconcile other people back to God. That's our purpose. And if we are not reconciling people back to God, then as Christians, are we living out our purpose? And as you know, I love to do, I love to prove it, right? I just, I just don't want to say something that might sound good to you, but I want to prove it to you, right? So 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says this. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, anyone, that means if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've made the profession of faith, maybe that sounds a little bit more familiar to you, if you've been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, if you had just made that decision that God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are going to, going to govern your life any way you want to put it, this is what Paul says. He says, you're a new creation. You're a new creation. If you said a prayer, if you, if you, if you were sincere in your heart that Jesus is going to be your Lord, then you are a new creation. He says, the old is gone. The new is here. The old is in reference to the, the old man, the old way we used to live, right? And he says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us what? What did he give us? It's on the screen, right? Can you see it? That God was reconciling the world. No, it's the, you got to go back. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, here it is, who reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and gave us the ministry. That's interesting. He calls it a ministry. These are key words in this particular passage. There's a ministry that had been given to us when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and the ministry is reconciliation. The ministry is, is teaching other people about Jesus, about God. And verse 19 says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. He's not, he's not holding our sin against us. Why? Because Jesus, he was the final sacrifice offered for our sins. And he has committed us to the message of reconciliation. Well, who committed us? Well, God committed. Did you know God committed you? I don't think, I don't think you know that. Some of you are looking at me like, wow, this is, this is interesting. Listen, you've been committed. And, and a commitment's a commitment. You can't back out of this commitment unless you want to just disobey God. You can't back out of this commitment. This is a commitment that, that's non-negotiable. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is non-negotiable. This is non-negotiable. Like, I have to, you have to be participating in the ministry of reconciliation. And if you and I are participating in the message of reconciliation, guess what's going to be filled by Easter? Guess what's going to be filled by Easter? The, the kingdom of God. Oh, y'all aren't getting it. So, so listen, so those of you who do not participate in the message of reconciliation, this is what the Bible says, that you're a disobedient child. See, you should have let me talk about football. See, we wouldn't be here this fast. But you and I have a ministry and the ministry is reconciliation. Let's, let's continue. We haven't even got to the good stuff yet. Hey, this is what he says. He says, therefore, Christ, <coughs> we've been committed to the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making an appeal through us. First, it was through Christ. He sent his son, right? And he redeemed us through Christ. He reconciled us to himself through Christ. Christ was the ambassador of God. And now you and I have this ministry that we've been committed to, non-negotiable, and therefore God is making an appeal to other people through you. 
through me. Are you seeing how this works? Do you see why the way we live is so critical? Do you see why the way we act in our community is so imperative? Do you see why there are certain things we should not do and should do? Why? Because you are now an ambassador for the king of kings. You and I have a ministry that we are participating in. And the ministry is not just coming to church. The ministry is bigger than that. The ministry means that your friends are going to hear the message of reconciliation. Well, they're not going to like it. They're not gonna, they're not, they don't want to hear this. We'll find people who will. That's the parable of the great banquet. Go find somebody that will hear the message. Go deliver the message of reconciliation. Listen, every Christian, listen, every Christian has this, this mandate on their life. And for us to live as if we don't is to live a farce from, from Scripture. It's to, live, it's to live a life that is erroneous, to live a life to say that we are born-again believers, that we are Christians, but yet you never, you never engage in soul winning. You never engage in evangelism. You never engage in the ministry of reconciliation. Listen, I don't care how many hours you volunteer to the church. I don't care how much money you give to the church. I don't care what you think you do for the church. If you are not involved in the message of reconciliation then you're still living the old man because the new man is involved in reconciliation. Y'all are quiet. <laughs> can, can we go, can, should I continue? <laughs> you're like, I hope his voice goes out before this end of the message. I really do. So guess what the early church did? The early church was passionate about this. When I say the early church, I mean like the first century church, the second century church. I mean, they were passionate about reconciliation. They were passionate about seeing people hear the message of their crucified Savior. They loved it. They loved it. They lived for it. In fact, they did everything they could possibly do to become martyrs for the king. Think about that. Like they did everything they could do to lose their physical life for the kingdom of God. Imagine if we lived that way. Imagine if we lived in a way that we would do everything we could in a, in, with all of our might. That we would actually lose our life by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. My goodness, I, I, think, I think Laredo might be different. I would be different, right? You would be different. And so guess what they did? <coughs> so they would create traditions. And one of the traditions that they created was that they would, they would begin to fast the closer they got to Easter. The closer they got to Easter, they would begin to fast. They would set up these, these, these fasting uh, periods of time. People were being baptized. People were going to uh, give their life for God. And so the closer, as you see, as we're getting to Easter, you can probably see where I'm going with this. They embraced, they embraced the 40 days because it was, it was representation of what Jesus did in the wilderness. Representation. And so they created... This, this tradition called Lenten. And as, as we are furthering on in, 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 in time, well, the Catholic Church just calls it Lent. And Lent is just, it's just a word meaning a prolonged period of time. And, and, but did you know that it was not the Catholic Church that instituted Lent? It was the Christian Church. The instituted Lent. It was the Christian community. It was it was the the second century Christians that said, "Listen, there, there, we ought to do something as Easter is coming to 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 reconcile ourselves in a way." Or let me reuse that word because many of you are probably being confused by that. To set aside ourselves to 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 prepare ourselves for the celebration of Easter. 
And so what they did is they said, we're for 40 days, we're going to prepare our hearts. And we're going we're gonna to focus on God and everything about God. I'll let that settle in. Like, oh my goodness, we're turning Catholic, we're going to participate in Lent. No. If that's what you're hearing, that's not, that's not what, what's being communicated. <clears throat> what I am telling you is that Lent was not a Catholic thing. Lent was a Christian thing. There was a tradition started by the early church to demonstrate their devotion to their Savior. It was, it was birthed out of the idea that Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness preparing for his ministry. So Luke 4 says, full of the Holy Spirit, left Jesus left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days, 40 days he did not eat. So like any good student of the Bible, you must ask yourself some questions. One of the questions that, that really hit my heart in this, in this scripture was 40 days. Like why did Luke, why did Luke, make it a point for his readers to know that Jesus was there for 40 days. Why? Why couldn't he just say Jesus was in the wilderness for a period of time, the devil came and tempted him after the temptation was over, Jesus, and he continues. So it got me thinking, right? Because that's, that's, if you're going to be a good student of literature, you're going to ask these type of questions. And so one of the things that we have to understand is that in Scripture, 40 is not just a number. But 40 has a very significant meaning. And, and I will be honest with you, when I, if someone was to ask me, like, hey, what does the number 40 mean? Or what does the number, you know, this number 7 mean? Or whatever, I, I'm really, I would have been like, well, 40 means testing. That would probably been the extent of my, of my answer, right? But how many of you know that it's deeper than that? 40 is, is, is an interesting number in Scripture. And so when Luke writes that Jesus had been in the desert for 40 days, it, it, it's, it gives us a bigger picture when you understand what the number represents. And so the number 40 represents the, the challenge. It represents a, commi- a commitment. It represents a change. 40 is a number that represents testing and trials. That's what 40 means. And, it's, and you see it in Scripture about 146 times, the number 40. And, and when you see it, you know that God is testing his people. There's trials in the 40 that come. <coughs> How many of you know that it's in the testing or in the trials of our life that we truly grow? It's, it's not, I love mountaintop experiences. I do. I love them. I think they're wonderful. I think they're great. And I, I like to be there. But when you study your life, the timeline of your life, you'll recognize that it's not, it's not at the mountaintop that you're really growing. It's usually in the valley that you're growing. You know, it's not until we face our giants that our, that, that our strength is tested. Our courage and our bravery is put on the line. It's, it's not until we face the lions then that our faith in God is really revealed. It's, it's not until our life is in a moment where no one on the face of the earth could actually help you but God alone. Or our faith is tested. It's not until we face our darkest hour when we know what we're made of. Unfortunately, listen, I don't, I don't make the rules. I, I've been living on this earth for 46 years, and so I know that in my darkest hour, that's when I know what I'm made of. When, when the vices of life are squeezing me and, and, and everything of, about my life is collapsing, that's when I know, okay, what, what, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? Who are you going to call on, right? 
And, and it's not until those moments when we truly discover who we are. So when Luke says 40, Jesus was in a test. We read it like, oh, man, he, he passed that, that test with flying colors. He was full of the Spirit, full of the Spirit. Well, last I checked, you're full of the Spirit. Hello? Last I checked. You're full of the Spirit, right? If you're a new creature in Christ, you're full of the Spirit. Last I checked, you probably had some dark days. You probably had some moments when you just were ready to quit. You, you probably had moments when life was so tough, the thought of you not existing seemed appealing. Do we just get real? 40, testing. Some of us, we're, we're not old enough to really feel the testing of life, right? But those of us that, that have experienced some test, <coughs> you, you can't minimize Jesus' moment here. You can't, you can't take away his human, his humanity and go, oh, he's Jesus, he's in the wilderness, he's cool. No, not at all. Because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead quickens your mortal body. The same spirit that lives in Jesus it lives in us, right, if we profess our faith. And I'm telling you, there are days when I look in the mirror and I go, don't want to do it today. I want to climb back in bed. I don't have it. There's no strength in this body. There's no mental fortitude to go through the, the, and face the giants. There's this, there, you know, the financial stress, the, 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 the people stress, the, the, the relational stress. Like, oh, my goodness, I just want to put my head in the bed with the pillow over it and just wait for tomorrow to come because maybe tomorrow will be better. Now, I might stand alone in those moments, but if I'm a betting man, every one of us in here that has had some life in you, you've had those days. And it's not until those days are in your life when you realize how strong you really are in Christ Jesus. It's not until you have those giants facing you, how you realize how your strength has really grown in your faith. But if those days never happen, then you never know who you are. In fact, James says this, he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, right? Not lacking anything. In fact, James says, welcome the test. Welcome the, the, the moments of stress. Welcome those moments where it seems like you, you have nowhere to turn. Like, that doesn't make sense to me. It seems counterintuitive. But then when you start thinking about the Bible, you're like, oh, yeah, because everything's opposite day with Jesus. If you want to live, you must die. Right? You're like, oh, I get it. If you, want, if you want to reap, you must sow. Right? Like, everything's opposite with Jesus. Like, why would it be any different in, in any other part of the scripture? Like, like if you want to be mature, you have to be tested. If you want to be a, 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 a growing Christian, well, then your faith is going to be tested. Romans says, not only so, but we also glory in our suffering. Glory in our suffering? What? Yes, because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Right? Right? Matthew 24, Jesus says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm till the end will be saved. My goodness. Am I? 
Are you, are you interpreting as I'm reading? Are you understanding what the scripture is saying here? Because I think, I think what we can conclude is that there's a responsibility on my part to endure the tough and hard moments of life, to put my faith in Jesus, to put my faith in God, to draw on the strength of the Holy Spirit. But nonetheless, at the end of the day, I'm the one who has to walk through the valley of shadow of death. I'm the one who has to pick up my rock and face the giant. I'm the one who is actually being lowered in the lion's den. I'm the one who has to go and face the armies that are against me. God is not replacing me so that someone else can do it. Are you getting that? Tell your neighbor, you're the one. That you're the one. You have to go through the battle. I don't want to go through this battle. I don't want to go through it either. But you're the one. And when you go through it and you get to the other side, you're stronger and you're wiser and you're braver and you have courage and you're not the same. Because 40 days of anything changes a person. It changes a person. The, 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 the pundits, the leader pundits, they tell us if you do anything for 21 days, it becomes a habit. Right? If you want to change something in your life, do it for 21 days and it becomes a habit. Imagine doing it twice. It, it, it's no longer a habit. It's like, it's who you are. It's who you are. There, there, are, there are characters in the Bible that had to face their trials. Take Noah, for example. He built the ark for over 120 years. Can you imagine doing something for God over 100 years and everyone mocking you and everyone making fun of you like, like rain had never been heard of? God had taken care of the, 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 plant, the watering of the plants from the dew of the ground. Water came up. It was it was amazing how God had created the earth, right? There's no, there's no rain. And God says, I'm going to send a deluge. Well, when are you going to send it, God? I don't know. Don't worry about it. Just build this ark. <laughs> when I have to be finished, don't worry. Just keep building. And then, doesn't that sound like the rapture? Like Jesus is coming. When's he coming? Don't worry about it. Keep reconciling. Well, I need to know when Jesus is coming. Don't worry about when Jesus is coming. You have a ministry to do. Go reconcile people back to God. Right? <laughs> we, we, have, we have all this hang up about prophecies and when Jesus is coming back. Listen, don't worry about when Jesus is coming back. Just be ready when he comes back. Right, Noah? So what does he do? He builds the ark and then he goes in it for what? 40 days and 40 nights. Can you imagine? I... I I'll, Thank God I was born in the 70s because I don't know if I could be in, a, in an ark full of animals. Like, I could barely stand one, one, my one dog. It sheds all the time. I'm like, oh, I'm like sweeping the floor two or three times a day, you know. I'm like, I want carpet. I just want this hair to disappear. I don't want to see it. That's gross. But you, you know what I'm saying, right? If you have an animal, like, you're like, oh, why? Imagine being Moses. 40 years, he lived in an Egyptian rule. He lived as an Egyptian son, being trained as an Egyptian. And then he spends 40 years in the desert, right, being trained by his father-in-law. And then he spends 40 days on Mount Sinai, not once but twice, receiving the word of the Lord for the people of God. Right, that's where we get the Ten Commandments. The hand of God is writing out the Ten Commandments, what, what he wants his people to do. Like we go, oh, he's there for 40 years. Oh, he's there for 40 days. And we read through it and we're going, that's nice. But come on, can you imagine doing anything for 40 years waiting for God's promise? Can you imagine doing something for 40 days waiting for God's promise? Like that's a long time. When you think about it, David... You take little David, the, the children of Israel were taunted by Goliath for 40 days. 40 days that giant warrior came out to, the, to the, the battle line, the front line, and he taunted 
the armies of Israel, the armies of God. He taunted them. Until David shows up. Forty days. Elijah, he goes 40 days without food and water. Mount Herb, right? He's there and he's doing what God's asked him to do. Like he's, he's, he's spending 40 days. Jonah, do you know the, the, the story of Jonah? Jonah is a, is a minor prophet who is sent to Nineveh and for 40 days he's, he's preaching to them. That destruction's coming unless they repent. The prophet Ezekiel, he lays on his side for 40 days because of the sin of Judah. Like, I, like throughout scripture, I'm just giving you highlights. And if you want to go and study these, I encourage you to do it. But I want, I'm trying to build a case here of why 40. And we're coming up to Easter, and, and there's, there, there's going to, on the 17th, there's going to be 46 days minus the Sundays, right? There's going to be 40 days that you and I have if the Lord should tarry. And I think we need to make some decisions in those days. I think we need to make some choices. Here's, here's the point that I'm trying to make. And, and, we're, and, we're, and we're pretty much done if our, if our um, worship team can come. Yes, we are. I, I read your thoughts. Yes, we are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but here's the point. Because you're not going to leave without the point. The point is that God has called us to be disciplined people. This is the point, that God has called us to be disciplined people. I was in a service the other day, one of our services, and it was, I think it was, a, it was a night of worship, and, and we were singing. The congregation was engaged. The, the worship team was leading in a powerful way. AVL was on point. Everything, everything pointed to, to us having a great service, right? And then this song came up, and the song is called The Champion. I don't know if you're familiar with this song. But it's, it's, it has, it's very lengthy in its words. But there's one part in the song that we sing all the time. And, and it's this part. It says, when I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down. Right? I have the authority Jesus has given me. When I open my mouth, miracles start breaking out. And it says, I have the authority that Jesus has given me. I'm like, man, those are powerful words. And I'm, I'm sitting over here in my spot, and, and I'm, I'm just going, man, those, those are powerful words. Man, man, th those are powerful words. And I, I'm just, and it just hits me. And I lean, I lean over to Pastor Greg, and I say, Pastor Greg, I, I, I'm really having a hard time right now with this song. Because I think, I think modern Modern or contemporary worship has has really created a, a a Christian that that is pretty weak. Like we sing songs like this, but we don't live out songs like this. I mean, there's a di and it started it stuck with me. It started getting in my in my spirit. In my I, our worship team's gone. Where's our worship team? Did you call them? They're on their way. And I'm like, one, this song is amazing. Yes, he's my champion. You should listen to it. Love it. It's sung by Bethel. And, and two, it's correct. You have authority. I have authority in Jesus Christ. But here, here's, the, here's the issue that I have. I, I think it's creating a culture of Christians that are getting angry with Jesus because when they open their mouth, walls aren't falling. And when they open their mouth, miracles aren't happening. And they're like, I thought, I thought this is supposed to happen. I thought if we sing the song, like, like these type of things are supposed to occur for every Christian. And, and I, I leaned over to Pastor Greg and I said, here's, here's the challenge. We're having this little, this little 
dialogue, right, in 30 seconds and say, here's the challenge for me, is that they want to sing the song, but they don't want to do what they need to do to get the authority. They, they, want, they want the feel-good words that come through music, but, but I don't know if people are really wanting to sacrifice their life the way it needs to be sacrificed in order to have that kind of power. And so you know what? You know what we do? We live with, 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 with our bad habits and we live with all this, this carnality in us because we know that if we were to truly if we were to truly live the way, the way the early church lived, the way Jesus has called us to live, then when you do open your mouth, there's authority and there's power. And I'm telling you, every demon in hell trembles at the name of Jesus. But when you and I say Jesus, it doesn't come with authority because it's all bunched up with our pride and our ego. It's all bunched up with our greed and our lust. It's all bunched up and we think we can combine the two. And I'm like, and Jesus is like, no. You can't. And we wonder why. You go pray for a demon-possessed person, they don't get delivered. It's kind of like the sorcerer, right, in Acts. Like, Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but who are you? Like, who are you? I'm like, oh, my gosh. And, and, and so we're, we're raising up a generation that loves to sing the songs about God. But they don't want to live out their life for God. In fact, we've become desensitized to it. And we are maybe caught up in that, that type of atmosphere where, where the music and the lights and the theatrics of it all can make you feel like you have the power. <clears throat> but the moment you walk out of this door, and life comes at you, you're like, I'm, I can't do it. Hmm. You know, Jesus said to Peter, he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Messiah. And Jesus says, you hit the nail on the head, son, because that was revealed to you by the Father, not by flesh. And because of that, because of the revelation, I'm going to give you the keys, right? The keys. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bound on earth will be bound, right? Right? That's power. That's authority. And the authority that comes with the power. But... Peter hadn't quite, Jesus had spoken it to him, but he hadn't quite lived the life he needed to live yet because you see it come later. You see it come later. You see it come in the book of Acts. You see it come when Peter has the, the reinstatement with Jesus, right? And then all of a sudden Peter goes, I know what I need to do. I know how I need to live. My question is, why, why aren't we witnessing radical movements of God? If you and I have been given the ministry of reconciliation, then why isn't the church radically changing its community? Like, like we, we can continue to, to, to play church. We can continue to come together and sing the songs. And some of us might even get mad and go, man, that's, this church is too radical for me. This church is too much. Like, like I need something that's just going to pat me on the back and make me feel good and send me on my way, right? Some, something that's not going to really push against my lifestyle. But I'm, I, I, can't, I can't do that here. I, I don't know why because, because there's this burning in me going, man, I might not be perfect and I might not have my life right, but I do know what the Word of God says. And the Word of God cannot be watered down. The Word of God is active and it's alive. It's sharper than any double-edged sword that when you preach it, oh my goodness, anointing that comes with it. In spite of the vessel that, that's delivering it, right? So the vessel has to get right with God. God doesn't have to get right with the vessel. My goodness. And so we either going to be a church 
and, and this is what I told Pastor Greg. I said, we lack anointing. There's no anointing in the house because the Bible says the anointing is what breaks the yoke. It's the anointing of God that, that touches the heart of people. And what did Jesus say? He says, because the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he has anointed me to do good works. And before he got anointed, he went and did the hard stuff. He spent the 40 days and the 40 nights. My church, listen to me. Are we going to get anointed? Are you going to do the hard stuff? Are you going to do what God wants you to do? Come on, church. Like, we cannot open our mouths and expect walls to fall if we're not going to spend 40 days with Jesus. How? Oh, there's got to be anointing in our life. And the anointing doesn't come just because we sing a song. An anointing doesn't come just because we gather together. Anointing comes because you spend time with God. Anointing comes is because you come ready and prepared. <laughs> it is so easy. It is so easy to be the church that pats you on the back. My goodness. Listen, I've been doing this for 20 plus years. I can, I can pat you with the best of them. I, I can send you on your way, making you feel good. But, but at the end of the day, I have to answer for the sheep that I have been called to equip. And if the sheep in this house don't have anointing, then we, my friend, have not spent the 40 days with Jesus. It's like that scene. I, yeah, you, don't judge me on this, on this, but th this scene is incredible. It's, it's, out of, it's out of the movie 300. When King Eunidas goes for a walk with his 300 warriors and he meets up with the Greeks, right? <laughs> and and they're, they're supposed to go fight the Persians. And, um, <clears throat> and so he meets up with the Greeks and the leader of the Greeks, he's like, He's like, you only brought 300 men. He says, no, I brought 300 warriors. What did you bring? And he's like, I have this many men. And he's like, you, Athenian, what do you do? And he's like, I'm a locksmith. You, what do you do? And he's like, I'm a welder. You, what do you do? I'm a farmer. He's like, Spartans, what do you do? What's your occupation? And they're like, we're warriors. My goodness, church, are you getting the picture? Like, we're, we're either a motley crew of people that just come together, or we are sons and daughters of the living king, and we have authority, and we have anointing, and we can do what God has called us to do. Or we don't. Or we don't. I, who, who's in charge? Who, who's in charge? But what, what do we? Are we gonna sing while you're my champion? I don't know if we. I kind of want to sing like a a song that makes demons run, like like the old song, like like Jesus. <laughs> Wait, how does it go? Like His name is is greater, and when when you speak His name, demons flee. Is there is there? You know what song I'm talking about? Can, girls, can y'all carry that? Do you do you know it? We're probably gonna have to give them some words. Listen, just let the anointing fall. Just let the anointing. But hear, hear this. Hear this. Hear, this, is, this is the end of my thoughts, and we're done. <laughs> the problem, and this is, this is my observation. It's, it's strictly mine. It's, this is not a biblical thing that I'm telling you right now. This is, this is your pastor's experience. But I think the problem is that we have a lazy generation. We have a lazy generation. And I, I'm right there with them. I, I mean, I'm right there with them, right? There's certain things about my life that I'm lazy about. And that's that one of them is like getting my health in order. Like I start, but then I stop. You, you, you know the journey. You know it. We, we do what we want to do. We do what makes us feel good. We don't ever push through the discipline to do what we ought to do. That's my observation. The reason the church of God doesn't have anointing is because people don't want to push through the 40 days. They don't want to push through 
what is necessary in their life to get the spiritual growth. They want to, they want the 30 second TikTok message. They want it quick. And if it's not in 30 seconds, I don't have time for it. If it's not given to me in 10 seconds, like it's not in my life. But I'm here to tell you, listen, the Bible is not a microwave message. It is not an instant message. It is a message that takes a lifetime to, to, to grow us. And so we have to put in the work. We have to put in the work. And, and when we put in the work, everything about us changes. So here, here's, here's the deal. I know some of you thought, well, oh man, pastor's going to go do Lent, <laughs> right? 40 days? No. But what we are going to do is 40 days of transformation. I am going to challenge us to 40 days of transformation. Here's the first challenge. And you're going to get it. Next week, I'm going to have little printouts for you so that you can take with you. But this week, I just kind of want to introduce this, this, this hunger and this thirst. Like, listen, what kind of church are we going to be? I always ask us that. What kind of church are we going to be? We cannot, we cannot have the message of reconciliation without the anointing of God. You look at Jesus. Jesus was given the same message, but he came out of the wilderness anointed to do the work. <laughs> God wants to anoint us. Is, are we going to give in? So here's the first thing that I'm going to challenge you to do in the next 40 days. Starting on February 17th, I'm going to challenge you to read your Bible. I, I have talked to so many people that do not read their Bible. You read devotionals about your Bible. You, you read stuff about the, bu the, about the book, but you don't read the book. So in 40 days, starting on, on February 17th, listen, we're going to spend, we're going to do the hard work. We're going to do the hard stuff for the anointing of God. And I believe on Celebration Day, Easter Sunday, this house will be filled because your life is being transformed and you are engaging in the ministry of reconciliation. So you're going to read your Bible. Here's the second thing you're going to do for 40 days. You're going you're gonna to be healthy. I want you to pick a diet, and I want you to stick to it for 40 days. I don't care what diet you pick. You want to pick a paleo diet. You want to pick a keto diet. You want low carbs, high carbs. You, you want to fast for 40 days. Do something. Pick it and stick to it for 40 days. 40 days. Here's the third thing. I want you to exercise. 30 minutes a day, you go walking, you, I want you to get out, just go exercise. 30 minutes a day, you're like, is this spiritual? <laughs> Absolutely, because if you're dead, how's God going to use you in the ministry of reconciliation? If you can't get out of bed, like how's God, if you can't walk a block with your neighbor because you're so out of breath, and you want to, he, your neighbor walks every day, you're going, you know what, I'm going to go walk with my neighbor. But you're out of breath, you can't keep up with your neighbor. Come on. Yes, it is spiritual. I want you to exercise for 30 minutes a day for 40 days. For 40 days. Pick an exercise. Whatever you pick, do it for 40 days. Say, you tell yourself, I am going to go do the hard stuff to get the anointing. Is, is being healthy and exercising the hard stuff to get the, <laughs> I, I see you. I see you. Is, is, I'm going to do it. I'm gonna, I have to do it. I'm the leader, right? Here, here's the fourth thing I need you to do. Is an act of kindness. Every day, you give an act of kindness to someone outside your circle. You should already be kind to your spouse and your children. I, I want you to be kind to someone outside your circle. In other words, a stranger. Pay for someone's HEB bill. Pay for someone's gas. Pay for someone's Starbucks. You're like, oh my gosh. Like, yes, I want you to radically, radically introduce acts of kindness to this community. If you know someone that is without, take them something. 40 days of active kindnesses. You can do it. We can do it. 40 days. Imagine, start with your neighbors. My good, you, things are radically going to change if you begin to do this. Here's the final thing and the fifth thing. I want you to pray. I want you to pray. 
You see, Jesus, what he did is he went to the desert and he, 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 he studied. I don't know. You just knew he studied, man, because he, everywhere he went, he talked about the prophets. And he talked about, you know, the, I mean, I, come on. He picked up the scroll of Isaiah uh, and he began to read where it was found about him. Like, you know he studied. I can't say he read the Bible because the Bible wasn't, wasn't collected yet. But the prophets were. He was healthy. Believe it or not, 48 days of fasting resets and recalibrates your body. It recalibrates your body. He was healthy. He probably did exercise. There's no way to be in the wilderness and not climb the mountains and not walk and not do what he needs to do. He was at least 30 minutes engaged with him in physical activity. But we know Jesus is the epitome of kind. And I promise you, he prayed. He prayed. Guys, do, do you want the anointing? I, I'm asking, do you want the anointing? Maybe you're watching online. Do you want the anointing? I, I don't know what the anointing is going to look like in the 21st century, but I do know this. If you do the hard stuff, if you do the hard stuff, <laughs> The 40 days come Easter Sunday, our minds might be blown. Our minds might be absolutely blown. The Bible says one can chase a thousand, you two put 10,000 to flight. Imagine if every one of us in here got serious about God and did the hard things in 40 days. Mm. That's the challenge. Here, here, here's, here's the thing about the prayer. It's going to start on February 17th. This church is going to be open at 6 a.m. And we probably won't shut it until the evening. So you can come and pray. If you want to come pray here, come pray here. It's not going to be a, 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 a service of prayer. It's just going to be music playing in the background and you talking to God at 6 a.m. if that's what you want. It's going to be open for 40 days of prayer in this house. I invite you to come. Do the hard thing. Loose what's in heaven so it can be loose here on earth. Loose it. The keys are ours. You, you want this song to actually have application and not just theory? <laughs> Do the hard stuff. And when you open your mouth, walls will fall. When you, when you lift your voice, miracles will happen. Come on, church. Stand to your feet with me. I get it. Not everybody's about it. Not everybody's about that, right? A little radical, a little crazy out there. I don't know what you're, what you're, what you're preaching out here, Pastor, but those of you that do, chase it. Chase it. Those of you who haven't quite wrapped your mind around it, Keep coming, keep coming, and I promise you, the Holy Spirit's going to meet you here, and it's all going to click. Revelation's going to happen, and you're, you're going to know. You're, you're going to know, but you, get, you, you can't just run away from it. You've ever said, if you've ever said in your life, I want to go deeper with God, you never knew what that meant, the next 40 days is going to radically change your life. It's going to radically change your life. After every incident of 40, if you study the Bible, the number 40 there is radical change. Radical change. At the very least, we're going to be healthy. <laughs> At the very highest, you're going to be anointed. You're going to be anointed. starts, starts here, starts with us, those of you watching, listen, there's so much work to do, but I think the next 40 days, we pause the work, we do the hard stuff, 
and we see what the Holy Spirit does. Are you with me? Are you with me? Do we have a song? Can we, can we, can we end out in a song? Yes? I'm sorry, did I put you on the spot? You're good? You're good? Good, okay, here we go. Y'all gotta come forward, you gotta lead us. Can, can you encourage them? The demons run and flee at the mention of your name, King of Majesty. There is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am. The great Listen, there's a, there's a word in scripture that God calls his people to, and it's consecrate, consecrate yourself to the Lord. And, and I love the image that pastor said, we're not just a group of people, hodgepodge group of people just asking for God's grace, making it through life together. We are the warriors of God who build his kingdom. As he works in us, he works through us. And listen, we don't have to be worthy. You look at all the people God used, it wasn't because of their great talent and ability, it was because his power was at work within them. They were men, women, just like us, and yet his power was at work. And listen, I believe in, in the scripture, God says, consecrate yourself to me, for tomorrow you're going to destroy the enemy. Consecrate yourself, for I will do great things in your midst. How many believe God will do some stuff in our midst, anoint us, work through us, if we'll consecrate ourselves to him? How many of you are ready for God's power to be at work in your life in a greater way? Come on. So you have some time to think about it this week. Begin to ask God, show me how to do this, God. Show me what you want to do in me. This isn't just a list of things we're thinking about. This is, we're believing God is calling us to a new level. And as we consecrate ourselves, listen, here's what happens. Don't miss out. Don't miss out. 
Don't look back after 40 days and go, I wish I would have jumped in, or, or I, these are the things I ought to have done, but I didn't. Let's do it together. Amen? We can get accountability partners, get someone that, that, that's going to help encourage you. Don't miss out. I believe God's going to do something great in our midst in this next 40 days as we consecrate ourselves to him. And we're starting next week, right, Pastor? It's after next Sunday. We'll begin the, the following week, yes? So you have some, some time to say, God, begin to do a new work. And start. Start this week. Say, God, I want to see you work in the next 40 days in my family and my life. You think we can do these five things? Can we do it? We're going to see God do some great things in our midst. I'm believing for it. God, we give you the glory, and we thank you for the work you're going to do. It's all for your glory in our lives. Be magnified through the rate of first assembly through our lives in your precious name.